So hello everybody, it's a pleasure to have uh, Petra uh, Brüder today here from uh, Fermilab in Northwestern. So we, he will tell us something about uh, neutrino oscillation and I think this is also neutrinos are the main uh, main thing he has worked on. So he uh, did his master in, at Zucker University, then he moved on to Mainz, then to Heidelberg, Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg and uh, yeah, now he's at Fermilab in Northwestern. So, uh, Let's welcome him, and please. Thanks for the invitation. So uh, my understanding is that uh, this uh, 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 group uh, has a very wide research topics, and maybe neutrinos for most of you is not the primary topic of work. So uh, I will actually try to first do some very brief intro, very light introduction of what's going on in this topic, and then I'll just discuss uh, two of my uh, works from the last year, namely one is the energy dependent neutrino mixing parameters and over the end of the talk I'll discuss a bit the uh, minimum anomaly. Uh, so yeah, we have the neutrino oscillations uh, which is a Nobel Prize awarded phenomena from a couple of years ago and the oscillations were first uh, discovered at Super K uh, in Japan in 1998 from the atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, then there was the slow experiment saw, uh, uh, in 2001, who confirmed that. And first time from man-made neutrinos, we had the neutrino oscillation discovered from a Camelland experiment. And these are three extra experiments, which in 2012 uh, uh, got the five sigma result for the last of the uh, uh, mixing angles, that's the so-called reactor mixing angle, and who joined the show the most recently are these acceleration-based experiments. Uh, where you have minus T2K, and in the US later NOVA, and Dune is going to be a very important versus player in this game. So let's start with some open questions in neutrino physics, and since I'm a theorist, for me the most important is uh, what is the origin of neutrino mass? Uh, I don't have uh, any dedicated of these experiments to point you at and say, okay, this experiment is going to answer to that question, because this is mostly theoretical, uh, but uh, I will actually have in my uh, first a part of the talk on the first topic I'll actually discuss how this origin of neutrino mass can actually be probed for a particular class of models at oscillation experiments. Uh, then there's the CP violation in the neutrino sector and for that we have uh, two big experiments which will hopefully unravel uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, current present unknown and this is Dune here in the US shooting beam uh, the beam from Fermilab will be shot uh, to the fire detector in, uh, uh, in South Dakota. Uh, sorry, uh, this is Fermilab. <laughs> Other way around. Um, and there's also the hyper Kamikande detector in Japan, uh, which is basically super Kamikande with uh, more water, order of magnitude more water. Um, and there will be uh, main experiments for that. And then there's the ordering of neutrino masses. There's a dedicated uh, program in China, the Juno detector, which is able, to, which we hopefully be able to discover that because of their excellent energy resolution. And the Dune and Hyper-K will also have a chance uh, to uh, to probe the ordering. The problem is that usually the West is on the left, and you have it on the right. Well, no, 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 but the nice thing is that the, the nice thing is that they bring go from the left to right. Yeah. <laughs> that is important. Uh, then the next problem is whether neutrino so is we're watching the earth from the other side. The next one is whether neutrino is its own antiparticle, whether it's Marana or Dirac, like all the other fermions in star model. For that we have a couple of projects here on the neutrinos double beta experiment in the US. I actually put a picture from one in Italy, Quore. Uh, and uh, uh, then there is the absolute scale of neutrino mass, which is now being tested. This is the famous plot from Katrin experiment in Germany, where they, uh, this detector barely passed between those two houses. But by now they have more plots to show they actually have the leading results on the absolute scale of neutrino mass. I'll just show that in a bit. And finally, there's some experiments which are just giving us some results that look weird. Um, and uh, I'll discuss that as well. Uh, and uh, basically, for, to resolve that, are there some new? Is there some new physics in the oscillation sector? Is there some more neutrinos? We have an ongoing short based on neutrino program, which will consist of three experiments: Microboon, which is already uh, publishing data; Icarus, which is there and operating; and SBND, uh, which has been uh, approved. So let me spend a couple of um, uh, seconds or minutes on each of these questions. 
And uh, during the talk, these questions may appear uh, in the titles of slides. So there will be a lot of questions uh, during this uh, uh, during these slides, just so that you know which kind of or which of these I'm trying to answer or discuss uh, in a particular slide. Uh, so the first one is the origin of neutrino mass. Just a very light intro. Uh, there's a lot of models uh, at the tree level, at the radiative level, how to build a neutrino mass because it's masses, masses in the standard model. So the most popular realization is the type 1 CISO, where you just add the right-handed neutrinos and you form this uh, you have a, this uh, lepton portal between the uh, 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 doublets in the standard model, Higgs and the right-handed neutrino, and you put the mass for right-handed neutrino. You build this mass matrix and you just diagonalize this. Uh, you can even do it in a two times two formalism and you get the expression for neutrino mass. The higher, the heavier the right-handed neutrino mass, the lighter the neutrino, and this mismatch is usually illustrated with one of these uh, funny pictures here. Uh, I will discuss later uh, one uh, model uh, at the loop level, which I will use uh, throughout the talk. Then the second question on the previous slide was the CP violation and the mass ordering. So in the third model, we have left-handed neutrinos. So let's do a parity transformation and look at this in the mirror. You get the right-handed neutrino, but we don't have that uh, in the star model. Then you can play the game like, let's do left-handed neutrino and try to do a, a charge conjugation to left-handed anti-neutrino. We also don't have that. But if you do both C and P transformation, you go from left-handed neutrino to right-handed anti-neutrinos, which we have in the standard model, which means that to test the CP violation in the lepton sector, you just look at these differences between the oscillation probabilities between uh, 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 neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. And this is proportional to the uh, so-called the Arsklog invariant, uh, which is then proportional to the sign of a delta CP, the phase, CP violating phase. Uh, regarding the mass ordering, uh, we don't know whether the ordering is normal or inverted. In other words, uh, this ordering between these two states, nu1 and nu2, is well established from the solar experiments, because we know the matter effect from those neutrinos and what is the survival probability for those guys. But we're trying to see whether this new tree is actually lighter or heavier than those. And that at the oscillation experiments, we can only do the mass per differences. Uh, so the current status of the oscillation uh, neutrino parameters from, for instance, from this Spanish uh, uh, new fit uh, group, is that uh, um, the angles are fairly well known. This is the uh, solar mix angle atmospheric reactor, apart from the reactor, which has some spread uh, because we still don't know the octant. But the delta CP is really unconstrained uh, presently, and uh, this should be something to be measured at Dune and Hyper K. Then the next question was uh, Marana or Dirac. Uh, you know the Wagner rule, right? No. For the mixing angles? The Wagner rule? Theta rubber. 1, 2 is 3, 4, 34. And theta 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, 5. Ah, okay. But 34 is beyond, uh, isn't it 31 plus minus, let's see. I think but, you're not uh, in the one, one sigma region. Yeah, but, uh, so it will move. <laughs> well, no, you, you're good. You're still in three sigma range. Here. Ah, very good, very good. Yeah, let's see what the future is. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, here, if uh, uh, neutrino is Marana, if uh, we can measure uh, the neutrino's double beta decay process, where you just uh, connect these two lines, and the neutrino is not the external line, so you just have two electrons in the final state. And actually, currently, the experiment start, start to probe the inverted ordering, and normal is uh, more difficult. There's more R&D that needs to be done to do that. Uh, but yeah, this, this field is moving forward. And I'm coming back to Catherine and their funny picture with the detector, and now they have a physics result. They're doing the beta decay experiment. They're looking at the endpoint of the beta decay spectra, and uh, based on that position, they see uh, what is the constraint on the neutrino mass. Um, there's also the limit from cosmology, which is admittedly the strongest, but that one is the easiest to uh, avoid if you want to build some model that uh, actually if you actually want to avoid it. You can postulate neutrino decaying or some non-standard cosmology, so people are playing very different games. But uh, in the standard cosmology, this limit on some of neutrino mass is currently around a point, uh, 15 electron volt or so. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? So this core experiment, what's the time scale? So this is a already existing bound? Oh, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, this is this experiment in Italy and Gran Sasso. Yeah. And they're just, they just recently published results uh, how they barely cut into this region. Actually, this should be taken with a grain of salt because uh, what enters in this is the uncertainty of the nuclear matrix element, which yeah, is usually yeah, a factor yeah. of two. 
So uh, depending which kind of calculations you adopt depends uh, how, how well you're actually positioned on this uh, plot. Uh, but uh, given most of the, those calculations, it's fair to say that they're now entering this in okay, the northern regions. But do they have the chance to probe the whole region? Or is this uh, yeah, I think the chance to probe the whole inverted ordering region in the next decade or two is very realistic. Okay. But to go all the way down because you know yeah, this is okay. log, yeah, yeah, that's, this that's, log that's, scale, that's, so that's, that's very challenging. Uh, my last question was about stellar neutrinos. So how did we uh, end up with discussing those? Uh, there was the uh, LSD experiment uh, in uh, Los Alamos National Lab, which was producing neutrinos from stopped pion sources, and actually found the excess of uh, electron antineutrinos from the NUMU bar beam. Uh, this is uh, stacked histograms, the red and, and green. This was the expectation, and this is the data. And blue is the fit to the data, assuming some new physics, namely those stellar neutrinos that I'll mostly touch on the next slide. Um, but you can basically see that this is a three sigma excess, and it was enough of a motivation for people uh, to shoot for mini boon, uh, to uh, build mini boon uh, at the Fermilab site, which was uh, then finally also reporting the excess of uh, electron like events at, uh, at low energies. And that one, for mini boon, we have 4.8 sigma. And in combination with LSND, this is 6.1. So I'll discuss this. Uh, uh, this is going to be on the on the uh, last part, uh, last part of the talk. Uh, can I just ask you for yeah, yeah, I just uh, read online somewhere that there, there was a new mini boon result and it somehow went away. Or oh, there's a micro boon result which is some tension. I'll ha I'll have uh, slides on that uh, toward the end of okay. the talk. Okay. Don't worry. So, um, just to mention for Miniboon immediately, Miniboon cannot distinguish the showers induced from electrons and photons. Uh, so uh, for their background contributions, uh, which are these stacked histograms here, you will see also some stuff like pi zero, pi naught decays, or decays of uh, heavy baryonic resonances. Uh, but uh, uh, let me come to that. Uh, um, yeah, and the leading explanation for that uh, has always been this three plus one, just add one star neutrino. Because if you just look at the usual mass square differences in the neutrino sector, you know that the effect should appear at this L over E around 500 or 15,000 kilometers per GeV, depending which ones of these two you're taking. But now, if I have some effect at one kilometer per GeV, it's very easy to engineer a new mass square difference of one EV squared at which you would expect some significant phenomena. Uh, but actually, uh, this uh, doesn't work in the global picture. If you put in all the experimental results, namely here the appearance experiments. Uh, you can see that the uh, region, let, let's not worry what is on the on, on the axis. You can see basically that uh, here the, the region for Miniboon and LSND is to the left of all these constraints from Opera, Icarus and Nomad, but when, which is good from the appearance experiments. But when you go to the disappearance experiment from the searches from Moon neutrino disappearance from Ice Cube and Minos primarily, this in blue and light blue, uh, you see that the preferred regions are to the right uh, and they're in certain tension, very strong tension uh, in, in that sense. That, that, this is what motivated people to build more models and uh, I'll discuss that uh, uh, later. So yeah, I think now we're kind of ready to, uh, to start, uh, I'll, I'll start discussing uh, this first paper here. Uh, that was done in collaboration with my two colleagues at Northwestern Fermilab, Andre and Pedro. And also the uh, Babu, who is uh, he's a model builder from uh, Oklahoma State. So I just wanted to, uh, I, I think you all know this better than me, but I, I have this uh, intro slide on the renormalization, just to you know, recap for anyone who might not be uh, familiar, though I'm almost sure that you are. Uh, if you just start from the QED Lagrangian and write down you know, the fields and the masses, all these zeros are the bare terms and they're infinite, because once we start to do the loop calculations, everything starts to be infin infinite. Uh, but we have a very nice uh, strategy which works remarkably well. Uh, we just played this, we rewrite this line in, in, in form of this line. The first part is the renormalized uh, Lagrangian and the second one is the counter term. And we just uh, absorb all these inf infinities in the counter terms. So there are many relations to go from here to here. And one of them is the relations for the electric charge. So this is just the connection between the renormalized electric charge and the bare electric charge uh, in the QED. And one can define the beta function for how to see how this goes with the energy. And this is just a simple set of algebraic maneuvers. And at the end, you just need to solve this uh, photon polarization diagram uh, to get to see what is the beta function. And, 
uh, here's the result. I recently did this calculation by myself, and I just cross-checked with Wikipedia, so it must be correct. <laughs> 12, pi, 12 pi square is uh, in the denominator. Uh, yeah, uh, and there are actually collaborations which are uh, looking for that. Uh, so, for instance, Chloe collaboration established uh, uh, these effects from the running uh, in the uh, QED coupling constants, and they found that the data agrees with uh, combination with both lactonic and hadronic contributions. And you can see here from the plot that hadronic are, are actually more relevant. And I'll also show you here the running of the Q, uh, QCD coupling constant, which have been well measured. This is just a beta function at one loop. At this point, this is known at many loops. Uh, and there's more examples of and measurements of things running in the standard model. Um, so, for instance, big quark running has been measured already by Delphi collaboration in 2006. They have the measurement from semi leptonic B decays, and they have the measurement from the Z decays. And you can see that this both agree very well with this theoretical prediction in yellow, of course, theoretical plus uncertainties. And recently there was a paper on the B, uh, B quark mass at the Higgs scale, so they also did that. Uh, CMS collaboration published the running of the top quark, which also agrees very well with the theory here. And you may know that this is the uh, famous plot for the running of the Weinberg mixing angle. Uh, and there are measurements like for stemming from the atomic parity evaluation to the lab. So the question is, what about the uh, neutrino sector? Uh, can we hope to uh, have some running there, experimentally uh, measured or discovered? Uh, for that, I will need some new physics, and I will be discuss that in a moment. But let me just set, set the stage on what I have in mind here and uh, how, what I'm actually thinking about the running uh, effect with neutrinos. So let's just write down the Feynman diagram for the production propagation and detection of neutrinos. In this case, I just stole it from one of these two references, which have in mind this Gedanken experiment produced neutrinos from Ws. Usually we would produce them from pions. So there, there are various ways how to produce neutrinos. And using this QFT approach, you can actually, uh, you can actually derive the neutrino selection formula. You don't need to use that usual method, like one-liner from the using quantum mechanical principles. You would get the same formula. But what is different uh, to the usual formula, what I'm putting here, I'm putting here uh, the Q-squared dependence on all the parameters that here uh, show up uh, in the formula. Like all these other uh, parameters here on the previous slide, the mass of B, these are also the parameters, uh, which in principle depend on the energy. And I'm putting the Q-square on each of the PMS matrix elements and also the masses. Now I just want to... Sorry, uh, to, to understand well, uh, what is Q-square here? It's the transfer momentum. Of what? Uh, associated to either production detection propagation. Now I'm about to discuss that. So I have different colors here. So I'm, uh, my claim here is that uh, there are different Q-squares associated to uh, production, detection, and propagation of neutrinos. So let's talk about production. If I have in mind pion decays, I need my stuff to be Lorentz invariant. So I can always sit in the rest frame of a decaying pion. Uh, and at that point, only the pion mass is the, the only relevant energy quantity. So it definitely makes sense that the uh, transfer momenta for the production should be the power mass itself. Now we have this neutrino which is produced, it travels to the detector, and in the detector it scatters, a T channel scatters on some nucleons, and uh, there's, be, there's going to be some transfer momenta for that, but the power mass will not enter that expression, because how neutrino got produced, that, that's, that's forgotten, and there's no power mass playing a role in the detection. So in the detection, the Q square is going to be something different, and for the experiments I have in mind, it's going to be at the GeV scale, a uh, few GeV. So there's definitely some separation between these two scales, pion scale and GeV. So if I can play some game of having the running of the PMS matrix between those two scales, maybe I can test the running effect. Uh, there's also the propagation to be discussed, because you see these masses here that enter the formula are also q square dependent. And now the question is, uh, at which q square should I evaluate those? And the answer is at the scale of neutrino mass itself, uh, because those neutrinos are on shell. Oh, Remember, cool. they're propagating thousands of kilometers. So it's not like in the colliders where Z prime would, Z, Z would just be off shell. It would not reach. So neutrino, if you want it to really reach the fire detector, it needs to be on its mass shell. So uh, let me see. Uh, what can I maybe quickly ask on this point? So the fact that you don't introduce one common scale, but several ones basically depends on the fact that you... It's on shell. If the genome was off shell, uh, it would be just one common scale. Okay. Okay. okay, but... Uh, okay, very good. So I, I, I'm very confused about the formula. 
Continue, continue. Let's see. So, okay, so we have, uh, we have now uh, uh, different PMNS matrices corresponding to the production detection. And I, so I thought, uh, sorry that uh, I uh, go back one, one slide. So the Q square that you put here is what? The, in, the, in the mixing angles? So, uh, for, uh, so you have red and blue Q correct. squares? Correct, it's in the mixing angle. I have it on the next slide for two flavors, okay, so let's look at that. Uh, can you maybe ask another question? So if, let's suppose we would calculate some loop corrections for this, at which scale would you then evaluate the loop corrections? I understand you're not doing it. I'm doing that. I mean, uh, I'll have some uh, RG effects uh, uh, that will contribute to the running of the... But in principle, you could also have like a box or something. Uh, you mean the loop correction to this basic, uh, yeah. basic diagram for the neutrino propagation? Well, uh, I don't know how it works in the QT approach for the duration, but uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that would be challenging the uh, correcting. I'm, I'm not sure how that would but work. The neutrino in the middle are pro propagated for long distance. Yeah, so probably. Right, so yeah, this in can... principle should not be taking like. So a, so they, don't, they don't have a. It's very suppressed, right? So yeah, whatever. I guess so. I guess so. It's very suppressed, and you can probably forget about it. Okay, so let's see what happens in two flavors. I can parameterize the PMS matrix like this, and uh, I need to do it at two scales, production and detection. So I have mix angle at production and mix angle at detection. And what also enters in my formula for probability uh, for oscillations is this beta, which is the difference of two phases at those two different scales. Uh, and here's my formula for neutrino oscillation. First time it appeared in the paper by Yuval Grossman in 95, but not in this context. He was basically quantifying uh, charge current non standard neutrino interactions in the detector and the source uh, with this modification of mixed angle. Whereas here, I'm not interested in stat stuff, I'm just talking about the running. So, how th this formula may look weird, but you see, if the P uh, production detection mixed angles are the same, this term just drops, this is sine to theta squared, the beta drops, and you have the usual formula. So I just want to point out to those, if uh, for those of you who may be working with uh, Marana neutrinos and usually know how this is the same way how Marana phase enters in the parameterization. But I want to stress that this uh, beta here, beta, beta tilde, is not the Marana phase, and this has nothing to do uh, with the lepton number violation. The beta just appears from the CPU validating couplings uh, in the new physics sector. And I'll be discussing a model in the next slide. So uh, one, one uh, physical application is to move from two to three flavors. There, you, on top of beta, you would have alpha simply because you move from two times two to three, three times three matrices. And you also have delta CP at two scales, scale of production and scale of detection. And the formulas for, for uh, three flavors place is horrible. You don't learn much from it. But there are some uh, uh, nice uh, applications where you just uh, have the epsilons, you know, just assume this very small running and expand in those. And if you remember the formula for the CP, uh, we are basically doing that here. The first term is the standard one proportional to the R's clock. And here are my new sources of uh, CP violation. The one in red actually survives even when the usual delta CP goes to zero. And just uh, to clarify things, uh, this is not RG induced CP violation. This is just coming from, uh, from complex coupling that may exist in the new physics sector. Uh, and I'll definitely need those. And it's time to just uh, discuss the model. Uh, so uh, the model is scottogenic like realization. If you haven't heard of the scottogenic model, it's not important. It's just a very nice model where you can simultaneously build neutrino mass and also have a viable dark matter candidate because you have a parity symmetry Z2 and lightest uh, in the dark sector can be a stable uh, dark matter candidate. Uh, so we have a second Higgs doublet here labeled as H1. H2 is the usual Higgs. And what also exists here is the phi talking to right-handed neutrinos. Uh, what is a key for uh, my running thing to work is that phi and right handed neutrinos are very light. So imagine they were at the electroweak scale, like all the other particles. You would just integrate them out at such high scales, and below the electroweak scale, you would just be running some effective operators. And the contribution for the RG running, it would not be very significant. Uh, so I need this uh, phi and n to be very light. In other words, I need them to be dynamical degrees of freedom at the scale of uh, the experiment, for, at, the, at the scale of neutrino energy uh, for the experiments I have in mind. And this is basically uh, or, order GeV and the power of mass itself. Uh, one may wonder what is with the limits for, there are strong constraints for the right kind of neutrinos at such scales, uh, but this model is actually very convenient because with the Z2 symmetry, 
you don't have mixing. You, you forbid by default the mixing between the active and sterile neutrinos. So the model here is just a, a lepton portal which I introduced for the CSO. So just you say H1 doesn't acquire a fragmentation value. So you don't break spontaneously right. the, the parity. Right. The model is just, this is the usual scotogenic part with the H1, which doesn't get a web. Doesn't get a web. Right. And this is the new coupling that I need here. So this is our modification of the scotogenic model. We need some light particles. And you can see that this coupling here, Yn, the mass matrix depends linearly on it. So the strategy is to change the Yn, hopefully dramatically, uh, and, and that will feed into the change of the PMNS matrix. Just to strategize, you know, to outline the strategy. So what's the mass of the second installment? Uh, the mass of this guy, it's a TV. It's above the electric scale because it's a doublet, so it has some charred stuff in it, so you cannot put it light. So um, this is, for you, this is a H1? For me, it's H1, and H2 is a ton more Higgs. I know it's a bit weird. You could have just integrated out H1. Uh, I mean, H1 formally gets integrated out in this framework. It, it doesn't really uh, uh, contribute. The, the main thing here is in this coupling here and with very light particles. A is light. N is light and phi is light. Okay. And H1 is a TV also. Yeah. Wait, did H2 now gets a VEV? Uh, H2 is the standard model case. Right, but it gets a VEV, right? It gets so, a VEV. Yeah, so then that would break the Z2, wouldn't it? Maybe Z2 is on H1. H2 is plus. Right. right. Oh, this, gotcha. this is the standard model case. Uh, so the strategy is to write down the Hamiltonian, and this is the usual vacuum term for neutrino oscillations, and this is the matter, and in experiments I have in mind, there's the matter effects. So I basically start at the production scale, which we said it's the power mass. Uh, I sample the mixing parameters according to what, uh, what one can choose, and uh, 34 is one of the options, <laughs> still within the three, <laughs> three, <laughs> three sigma. <laughs> uh, nine, nine, the other is one, three, nine. Theta one three is should be nine. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think that one is also within three sigma. We can check. Uh, oh no, no, don't waste your time. What was it? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, oh, you're barely fine. It's just out out of three sigma. Uh, wrong experiment. Yeah. But we have some segments seven sigma recently, so we changed standards. Uh, exactly. So then <laughs> we have to rule out what. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. It is now accepted or desired. Right, so I start with the production scale. Uh, I choose order one to be the Vian coupling in the dark sector, and then uh, do the RGEs. This is one of the diagrams. It was also in the previous slide, how to do uh, for the RGEs of the Vian coupling. And I evolve just from here to here. So I don't go to the gut scale. I don't play that game that flavor people are usually playing. I really want to see something at the natural experiment. So I'm really living in this order to tour some to the very low scales. And then at the, uh, at the scale of detection, I can just evaluate my mass matrix. And when I diagonalize it, I get the PMS matrix. That's the definition. So at that point, I'm armed with both the matrix, PMS matrices at uh, production and detection. And uh, the experiments I have in mind here are the uh, T2K, where you produce neutrinos and detect uh, uh, in JPARC in Japan and detect in Super Kamikande, and uh, NOAA. Uh, uh, you produce it Fermilab and detect in uh, Minnesota, there's the fire detector. So, uh, okay, this was a very long formalism introduction, but I thought that was necessary, so I finally show you some plots. Uh, these are the usual bi-probability plots where you have uh, here the electron appearance from the muon beam and the electron antineutrino appearance from the uh, muon antineutrino beam. Uh, the data points for T2K and NOVA are here. And the yellow and the green are the usual standard model region if you just vary those mixed angles in their one sigma region. And my results from the running are here in the scatter, 42K and NOVA in red and blue. So uh, this looks like a very strong effect. And you can see that I'm even showing this on the log log, which is not what you usually see when uh, neutrino uh, uh, experimentalists, uh, if you see some collaborations showing this kind of probability plots. Uh, I should point out that this is for the normal ordering and the uh, lightest neutrino mass of 0.05 electron volt. And if I go down in mass to 0.01, the effect ceases, though it's still stronger and exceeds the standard regions. It's actually well known that uh, the, the running of effect is proportional to the mass squared. These are some uh, RGs from, uh, from the CIS of type 1 and some plots from other people who are used to play games at the gut scale. You see at the 10 to the 15, 16, strong running from such a large mass, whereas I'm just shifting this effect to very low scales to see if I can phenomenologically access something. So um, 
these are strong effects, but clearly if I'm here, or I don't know, here, this is far away from the measurement. So this, this clearly uh, is disfavored. And uh, to uh, eliminate some of those points, we use the constraints from short based on experiments. And uh, in this case, we have the mismatch between the PMNS metrics at production and detection. You basically have the effects at zero baseline. So you, uh, the flavor can ch uh, change at zero baseline. Um, and uh, the experiments we have in mind here is the, here's the list, here's the energies and the channels and constraints. We find the Noma de Nutev to be the most uh, significant because their energy is greater. So Sorry? for this to happen, it's very important that the masses are generated at the loop level. Then uh, uh, where does the... Uh, I mean, this is the model, but the model doesn't necessarily require the no, loop but, level generation. But the Q square dependence. You know, right, right. That's the RG. That's the RG part. That's uh, the thing going on here. This is the key. But, but it should be more than that, right? Because, okay, very good. So you say that the fact that the masses come at the loop level are not an essential component of this? Right. So this, If you do it for standard systems. Yeah. Uh, you can do it for standard systems. So when we have this example in the paper, but I'm not discussing that. And I didn't look into that too much because I'm afraid of this light scale and the strong constraints from the mixing. Right. So this is a uh, scotogenic model is a very good avenue because of the, uh, the Z2 symmetry. Okay. Uh, but uh, you can suppose this is just one example. You could this is just one of the example. You, you can do this in a class of models. You could add some other type of right, light right. physics to yeah, correct. get the same effect. Well. In principle, it can be generic. Well, the running effect is coming from this, uh, this phi scalar? Uh, it's coming from, uh, this is, for instance, one of the diagrams. It just comes from the diagrams where phi and n uh, are included. It's basically the uh, coupling, this uh, y n coupling appearing several times. And n is also very light. It is very light, yes. They're both around the pi on scale. But uh, you're running from what scale to what scale? I'm, I'm running basically from pi on scale to order two orders of magnitude higher scale. Uh, and what is the large coupling that appears here that produces that effect? Or what, what are the coupling? Oh, yeah, the yn needs to be large because if 10 to the minus 3, you would not have a strong running effect. Right. You see, it goes proportional to the yn to the third power. Right. So uh, I definitely need to choose it order one, otherwise, I'll be both loop and coupling suppressed. I'm already loop suppressed from the running. Uh, but I need large coupling there. But this coupling is between right here neutrino that doesn't talk to the standard model and, and this uh, new scalar. So I, I'm, I, I think it's fine. So UN is, YN is which coupling again? The, it, it's this key coupling between the scale, new scalar, light scalar. Oh, that coupling. Yeah, that one. Um, so yeah, where was I? I was here basically discussing these constraints. And after you apply these short based on constraints, you actually end up with this. I'm now showing the same plot as before. Uh, it's just that it's this uh, mass 0.05, it's not anymore on the log log because the short Bezan constraints have, have killed uh, all of those crazy points above. Uh, but you can see that this, uh, uh, there are scattered points here uh, also significantly exceeding the standard region in, in yellow and, and green. Uh, and uh, this can uh, definitely, the scope of this deviation is definitely such that in future it can be tested at T2K and NOVA. Uh, unfortunately, I'm mostly uh, focusing, uh, focused on these scatter points because the full model parameter space is quite vast. You know, if you want to build a neutrino mass, that's nice and cute, but you have many parameters like uh, so-called Casa Sibara parameters. We just increase the parameter space uh, rapidly. So I'm actually working on how to make this formalism easier for experimentalists to understand uh, and to maybe implement in their searches. What are the shaded areas? The shaded, these ones? Yes. This is just the standard regions without any new physics. So if that Yukawa was going exactly to zero, uh, uh, all these scatter points would converge uh, inside of those regions. Uh, just for the inverted ordering, uh, there's nothing much to say. The effect is similar. This is just for completeness. And uh, here, the running is actually a bit stronger because the masses in inverted ordering are larger. Uh, but the effect is quantitatively equivalent. Can you go back for one second? This one? So what is that, what exactly is being buried to generate those points? Like what, what's the difference between any two points in this scatter? Ah, uh, in the uh, red and blue. Or just in general, take take any two points. What's different between them? What right. Number, what so the uh, what is being varied is the values of the Yukawa couplings. This y n is the matrix. We choose it to be diagonal with uh, uh, with uh, entries, diagonal entries, which uh, vary in order one numbers. I don't remember, maybe between 0.2 and 1, I believe. Mm -hmm. Then there's the three Casa Sibara parameters to fix the neutrino mass. 
these are two parameters that go from zero to two pi. It can even be more crazy if you choose them to be complex than you have imaginary component, but uh, we didn't do that. Uh, let me see. Uh, there are, uh, this is this is what I, I already gave you like six or seven parameters. They could be uh, more. And uh, with the mixed angles, I'm doing the same. What I'm doing with the mixed angle to reproduce these standard regions, so I'm playing with the one sigma region uh, of those. Can we go back one more slide? Oh, okay. So you mentioned that on the right uh, plot, that's the the kind of result that you would get if there's no new physics. Or is that right? Uh, no, the right plot is the same as the left one, but for lighter mass. The mass of 0.01, and, and the reason why there's more points here is because the running is smaller, so uh, less points got eliminated by the constraints from short baseline experiments. So that's just uh, uh, this plot here zoomed in after applying the constraints. Uh, okay, so, uh, so let me just uh, go ahead. Uh, but do you have a sense for uh, like of the points that you actually uh, scan over? How many of them get eliminated versus not? Like, is this a scenario where only like one point out of twenty thousand uh, shows up as a viable non-excluded point? Uh, do you have to be tuned or not? That's my question. I, uh, it's not terrible, and the scans were not too dense. For instance, uh, let's talk about this very strong uh, 0.05, where the running is strong. I think this is the scan of uh, 20 or 50 thousands, and I think I have around 500 points uh, here surviving. And the situation is better as the mass is smaller, but then the running effect is smaller. So here on the left, I'm trying to be more provocative, but then, of course, uh, if you're more crazy, you, you run more, and then you can constrain this from other sources. Uh, here, these are more milder effects, and there you have more survivals. Uh, so let me finally show you some points that, uh, that the plots that are not scattered pl plots. And Sorry, and the, the blue and the red are, I mean, the two experiments, but the dots, uh, the scatter. The blue and the red, these are 42K and NOAA. Uh, the, uh, the green is 42K, and the, the blue one is for NOAA. Uh, ah, yeah, the green. Uh, uh, the, the NOVA, the one that has a hole, that's NOVA, and the green is the T2K. These are the standard regions, one sigma regions without new physics. Um, uh, yeah. So, so what is varied in the standard regions? Why are they regions? The, the, the mixed angles have certain uncertainties. So the phase is varied from 0 to 2 pi, and the mixed angles within their one sigma. Thanks. But your scatter points, red and blue, sorry. Right. Uh, those are also... The variations from the yellow and the green once you get the yeah, yeah. I, I take the variation from the standard mix angles and also all these new physics parameters that uh, I have in mind. So this is the, the parameter space. Uh, uh, it can actually be understood why the NOVA is wider than the T2K, but I, I may leave it for later. It's less, right? More matter effects, right? Uh, no, actually. Let's come back to that. I have it on the backup slide. Uh, I thought that this was big, originally I thought that this is because the NOVA is operating at higher energies uh, and there's bigger freedom, but uh, there is something else actually. Okay. Um, so uh, let me show you some oscillation probabilities uh, for two benchmark points. The left one, we did a very naive uh, chi-square analysis uh, to, uh, combining T2K and NOVA just to see uh, if there existing tension between these two experiments, and there is some tension because they report different hints for uh, delta CP, if this can be alleviated. And we get to some small, small improvements. And here in solid, I have the oscillation probabilities for neutrinos and antineutrinos. And the dashed is the same points with just Yukawa's mm -hmm. and the running effect uh, shut down. So that's the standard one. So but the tension is not uh, because in your plot, if you go to inverted hierarchy, the tension is much less, or seems to be much less. Right? Well, it's not, I think it's formally at uh, one sigma level. Or so. It's really not something, it's something that motivated people to write some papers with no NSIs. Uh, but it's not something that people should start worrying okay, about okay, right okay. now. Even though, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it's important for Dune uh, and, uh, and Hyper-K because, you know, they're competing. So where this converges is relevant, uh, but uh, probably not uh, right now for this talk. Uh, and here on the, on, the right, uh, uh, on the right panel, I have the venture point two. And you can see that these probabilities are going crazy. They're very much excluded already at NOVA because the deviation from this solid and the dashed is very large. So let's finally find out where all of this is coming from. Now I just show you the running of the parameters between production and detection scales for these two benchmark points. For first one, you can see this is the ratio. Actually, these are equivalent plots. This is in absolute units of mixing parameter in angles. And this is just the ratio to the value of the production scale. For the benchmark point one, the ratio is uh, always one for all the parameters because there's no real running. 
But for this other venture point where things get disfavored, the effect is coming from the very strong running of Ketaban 2. And it's known that uh, that parameter is uh, the troublemaker. That one always runs more than all the other parameters uh, by, by this ratio uh, of around 40 to 50 uh, stronger than, than the other two mixing parameters. Uh, I have just one more slide on this part, and then I'll try to quickly discuss also the miniboon. Uh, you can uh, discuss these running effects also in the context of high energy neutrinos. The ice cube measured uh, around 100 events, neutrinos from between 100 uh, TV and 1 PEV. And we don't know where these neutrinos are coming from. So what people usually do, they assume uh, they, they're interested in flavors. So you assume some flavor composition at production. For instance, this 120 would be the parent decay, 100 would be the neutron decay. And then you start from that, you apply some oscillation formula. Uh, the oscillation formula here doesn't have Bayesian dependence because neutrinos decohere and the wave packets separate, but this is the formula just without the Q squares. Yeah, I'm the one who uses the Q squares. And then they just show this, what, how this looks at Earth. And just how to read this, I don't know, you've probably seen this, but uh, here you just do the projections. For instance, this point is 40% electron, 40% muon, and 20% uh, tau. Uh, and then I, I can confront this uh, to this new physics scenario that I'm discussing. Where I'm just, uh, I need to just carefully plug in the production and detection of PMS matrix. And then uh, I can compare. For instance, this is the comparison where I put all these production mechanisms under the same umbrella. Uh, X goes from zero to Y, and uh, I don't uh, allow tau's to be produced because there's no good astrophysical models for that. You can see that the outcome is here that I populate a bigger portion in the parameter space than the standard case. Uh, why is this important? I can show on the next slide where I separate uh, this uh, in four different uh, production mechanisms. And this one here is relevant. Uh, for what I'm about to say. So this is the neutron decay. And you can see this green region is outside of the ice cube 68 CL uh, line, and it's touching the 95 one. So it's disfavored in the standard, in the standard scenario, just producing neutrinos exclusively from neutron decay. Uh, but if I put, plug this uh, new physics that I'm talking about, the running effects can induce appearance of many scattered points inside of this region. In other words, if there is this new physics I'm talking about, uh, this production mechanism, which is usually constrained, is now you know, back, uh, back in the game. And uh, uh, this was, uh, that was it. I would switch to Minibun. Is there any uh, questions at this point? I need to, uh, yeah, I still have like, uh, okay. go ahead. Just generally, since you're, you're really thinking about how scales change here as you consider neutrinos in different contexts, and you're doing that in the context of scenarios with right-handed neutrinos, uh, have you considered what this uh, formalism might uh, enable you to learn about leptogenesis? Like if you have a low scale leptogenesis, could you think of a scenario where running might be an important uh, part of the story? Um, so, uh, so all of this thing is happening below the energy scales when the sphalar and the couple. I see. Okay. Uh, so, I guess the answer is no, but we should talk about it later. Okay. Uh, because there would be more, I know that there are mechanisms like aphylic dyne and stuff like that. I think you can sometimes do this uh, virgensis at low, very low scales. Uh, but uh, maybe we can further discuss this uh, later. I, I haven't thought about it, but I'm just giving you what's on my mind just, right now. Just another question. So you showed this one plot where you get, get a bit closer to the experimental measurement, right? But I just wonder how significant this is. Well, yeah, I mean, this is 68 CL, you know. One but how many new parameters are you introducing? So you have. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm doing the same scan as previously. Right, but you uh, have, like, if you do this, this RGE running, you need this additional phi and the additional n, right? So you right. have two masses and you have the additional coupling. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing the same scan as previously. So this is the region which I can access uh, in the triangle. So, right, so you have, like, three new parameters, right? Uh, well, even more are being varied. I mentioned those Cassis Ibarra parameters that oh, right, right, right. Okay, so, even more, but right. then it's not surprising, not too surprising that you can end up well, this, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you somehow don't find anything here. You know, you're converging into some regions. So, uh, uh, you know, you need to, you, you get it and then you see what you have. And this is uh, all okay, I have for okay. this one. For the others, it might be less interesting. It's going to be more interesting when the ice cube gen 2 starts doing stuff, because you see that uh, their uh, sensitivities are you know, they're really going to converge at very small regions in the triangle. 
So let me try to uh, arrange my time so that I can also say something about the mini boon. This is uh, the work from the last year with my former with, with my uh, former PhD advisor. And uh, basically, we were wondering what's the deal with this mini-boon experiment that I introduced in the first part of the talk. Uh, the mini-boon, uh, and you remember the 6.1 sigma was quoted at some point. Um, so uh, the mini-boon collaboration has always, uh, okay, the first thing to say is that neutrino nucleus uh, cross-sections feature still very large uncertainties at the GeV scale. Neutrinos don't scatter on the free protons, they scatter on the nuclei, and this is a very active field of research. And there are several Monte Carlo event generators that, uh, that are actually on the market to which, which, with which you can actually probe uh, these things and uh, explore various natural interactions. So uh, what Minipun collaboration has actually used is the nuance generator uh, for their background estimations. And uh, this generator is not supported anymore. Um, and uh, uh, what we explored here is, uh, uh, what we explored here is uh, what, what is the effect of those uh, background contributions at Miniboon of uh, using this uh, other more, more novel nuclear physics implemented in these uh, various uh, uh, event generators? So basically, just a quick strategy on this side is we first use the generators that Miniboon is using, predict some event samples for a given background, compare it to the Miniboon, any differences compensated by uh, bin by bin tuning, and then we repeat the exercise for the other generators. Uh, including this uh, tuning and the same cuts and everything, and then just compare uh, what is the effect across these generators. Uh, there are a couple of channels that are relevant for Miniboon. Uh, the one obvious one for the, the excesses in the electron-like events here. So one obvious one is the upscattering of electron neutrinos. Uh, so uh, here's the result from various generators. The difference is uh, somewhat not drastic. The Gibu here is uh, among those that give larger predictions because that generator, for instance, is known to underproduce pions. If you have less pions, you have less strong uh, cuts on, on the event samples. And uh, what, uh, what is going to be on the x-axis in a couple of plots on the next slides is this reconstructed neutrino energy. You just assume uh, that this is a quasi-elastic process. I also uh, have the upscattering of moons, which is important because their collaboration uses that, but I'll just briefly touch on that a bit later. Another channel that the main considers is the neutral current pi zeros. So you can radiate pi zeros from the neutrino nucleus interactions, and this pi zero produce photons. If fo two, two, those two photons are very collimated, they can give you a one shower that will appear as an excess in Miniboon. Uh, or if one photon just converts to the electron pos positron pair only outside of the detector, that would also contribute as a one shower. Um, and here are our backgrounds uh, using the Monte Carlo predictions. And uh, uh, we also use something that is more close this is just from first principles, just using those generators. And here we also use some estimates to get something more closer to what Miniboon is actually doing, because in their experiments, they like to count pions, because uh, 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 they like to count uh, pions for this background. And here, basically, we uh, utilize the, uh, the pion event rates and the, the ratios between uh, the data and the simulation for each of these generators. But all this Gini Aren't, aren't they one an improvement of the other? Or, or oh, yeah, I forgot to say that for Gini, there are like six tunes. Uh, they, they share a lot. I, I don't really know much about this. Uh, they share a lot. For instance, for the resonant production, in this case, they use this Ryan Segal model, which is well known from the 80s. Uh, but uh, there are also some, some, uh, some discrepancies uh, that they use. Uh, I mean, these are uh, the Gini predictions from all these different tunes. You can take them as varieties, different variations of Gini. They're not giving orders to make to different predictions, but they somehow uh, have a little slight model uh, independence. But there is none that is uh, the final version of Gini. No, they are all uh, should be I mean, they, they release them uh, on equal footing. In, in so when I download uh, this, uh, uh, this... Very strange. Okay. Yes, these are... Uh, the different actually, tunings. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, final channel is the natural current single gamma, uh, single photon production. From uh, you can also produce the photons uh, from uh, from the scattering of neutrinos or nuclei. Sorry, uh, you can produce these heavy baryon resonances, which can decay to gammas. And these are predictions from the generators. And uh, uh, we also have a data driven predictions because what Miniboon is actually doing, they count pions and they multiply this by the theoretical branching ratios for the decays of resonances into photons. Um, 
And uh, basically we do that and we also vary this branching ratio with plus minus two sigma to see if one can actually explain the anomaly in that way. So I, I'm going quickly through. But now Microbone has tested this, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a slide on that. I have a slide on that. Um, so uh, uh, two slides actually. <laughs> Um, so um, now I can do the so okay. Uh, I was going quickly through these histograms because uh, they don't may not mean much to you right now. But uh, basically, just to convince you that we did our own background estimations for the mini boom. Now we plug this in and see what happens. Maybe we can explain the anomaly. Let's see. Um, so uh, we do this test in the usual three plus one model with EV scale sterile neutrinos. Uh, in this plot, uh, as I said, the model is formally excluded when you take all the data, but it's a very, very, very nice model to playground for this, for, for studying this minimum, because there are two parameters, the mass square difference and the effective mixing angle between the muon and electron neutrino. So uh, these are, uh, you're just extending the PMS matrix from three times three to four times four, and you care about the mixing of electron and sterile and muon and sterile. Uh, the minimum official results are here in shaded gray in the behind, and all these results from different generators, uh, our calculations are here. And we also can explain the mini boon anomaly at almost zero oscillations, uh, uh, oscillation mix angle, which on the first sight may appear weird because you need something to change flavors. But the thing is that, as I showed earlier, the, there's a, a mini boon. Uh, I showed the plot with the moon and up scattering. So the mini boon fixes the unoscillated uh, moon flux. That's interesting to calculation. So if there's some oscillation effect, that moon and uh, disappears into sterols. Uh, you would be underestimating your moon flux. So if it's actually larger than uh, they, they put, that would also boost the electron flux because the moon flux enter in their normalization. Uh, but you see, uh, overall, when you uh, move to the right panel uh, with the moon and the disappearance uh, um, uh, uh, element, uh, these regions are still tend to be on the right to the minus and ice cube results from before. So in that sense, uh, here we definitely didn't uh, solve that problem. Uh, let's look, let's see the final results here, and I'm showing this in front of uh, in, in in the in, in the form of the tables. These are just our background stacked with the best fit values from the sterile neutrinos, and here you just care about the last two columns because we don't care what are actually the best fits. Uh, so here is the uh, for both data driven and Monte Carlo predictions the uh, chi square for the no oscillation hypothesis, which you can just convert in the significance. So you can convert this uh, and you find these uh, numbers, which are not too far from what Minibun is having there, 4.6. So you can, uh, we can conclude, okay, the uh, result of this exercise was to say that the Minibun anomaly seems to be stable across uh, the nuclear physics uncertainties, and this may even motivate you to further think about new physics scenarios and stuff like that. Yeah, the plot, I, I have to confess, uh, so the, the plot, I, I found it, if I look at the plot on the right, what the, so it looks like uh, there is no such a big anomaly in the, or, or should I? Uh, uh, actually, or, it, or it visually uh, misleading. So well, uh, it uh, so many things. Uh, right, because uh, the genie just released so many tunes. <laughs> so that's why the plot is confusing. Well, if you look at the genie here, uh, that's why it's most instructive to just have a look at the numbers. Uh, the numbers. And, and the fir first bin doesn't really contribute too much to the chi square, to, to, to be honest. And uh, here you're seeing numbers which can get as low, you see, by one point something sigma lower than 4.6, but this is still mostly about three sigma. Maybe. So uh, I cannot say that nuclear physics effects are explaining mini boon, and this allows to play games. So our paper was in September, and then Microboon started uh, uh, publishing. This is from their uh, special seminar in October, the three different searches for the new background, and everything is summarized in this plot. Here's the expectation, here's the data, and if they were in, in agreement with Miniboon, this data would be here with very small uncertainties for these uh, three different searches, four, uh, and it's not. So the, this channel seems to be disfavored by Microboon. But, uh, but the uh, data is a mess compared to, to Monte Carlo, right? Or to what you expect? So it's, well, this search here with Pionless case has some very weird point, yeah, which they don't really pay too much attention in the paper. The one on the left, look at that. Yeah. Look at compare compare the upper plot with what you expect. It's a real, a real disaster, right? So then, uh, well, I, I don't know what's going on, but if it would have been an upper fluctuation at that size, we would all be claiming new physics. But, uh, 
Yeah, I, I, anyway, I, I, I this this way how they did this analysis and this uh, rescaling stuff uh, right. also in this plot uh, with uh, with this background that you mentioned earlier, it's kind of an early calculation. I think they're still aiming to improve and also have sterols included in their analysis. Mm -hmm. And this was from the Wine and Cheese seminar. This was actually their first result in October. Uh, I can just quickly go through it. Uh, actually, let me just say that again, uh, this data point here either here from the unconstrained or constrained background is still lying far away from the dashed yellow line. And if it was consistent with the micro bone, mini bone, uh, it would be there. So the micro, uh, the, the conclusion is uh, what we did is uh, the nuclear physics doesn't seem to be responsible. Um, and uh, these two channels from micro bone, uh, also don't seem to be uh, responsible. So there's more new physics to think about and people have been uh, publishing papers. And uh, um, here's just the summary of uh, this is actually stolen from one of the workshops that we had at Fermilab recently. Um, things can still be consistent and I see one avenue, for instance, uh, uh, several new physics scenarios where things can uh, explain the mini boon is the upscattering of muon and chignos to sterols, then these sterols does something. It can, for instance, decay to some Z prime, which goes to E plus E minus. So if this E plus E minus uh, appears in mini boon, which has poor angular, more poor angular resolution as one shower, Microboon might discover this as two showers. We don't know yet because they're currently searching for this particular model uh, because uh, this uh, would not be, uh, this is just a one, uh, one uh, track for the election. So if they actually, Microboon sees two different showers, uh, that, that would, for instance, explain everything. But uh, in general, the situation is uh, still uh, pretty much open, especially from this new physics perspective. Of course, one should stress that all these models also to some level constraints at other experiment because uh, we're talking about the couplings and interactions which also appear in the other experiments so one should really uh, discuss these models on an event uh, by event basis gordon is here he, i should just uh, praise him he wrote a very good uh, paper on <laughs> microboon i think it was public miniboon it was published in prl he he didn't propose a new model but he killed a lot of scenarios using the uh, microboon uh, beam dump search miniboon beam dump uh, search for instance, uh, we know, for instance, that uh, this uh, anomaly cannot come from the decays of neutral pions and cations. We failed to propose a model. We really wanted to be on that list. <laughs> <laughs> you would get more citations if you were on that list, right? Uh, okay, so let me... I get to be on your list. Ah, yeah, that, that as well. It's not my list. It's, I think it's from Matt Toops or someone. <laughs> I get to be on Matt's list. Uh, uh, okay, let me summarize. So in the first part of the talk, I was talking about the um, RG-induced mismatch between the PMNS metrics and the production detection scale. And I discussed, this, this really leads to a lot of new phenomenology. And we're still working on that uh, in the context of sterile neutrinos. So for instance, what I discussed this uh, today was the zero baseline failure affects new sources of CP violation. And something that I didn't mention explicitly, uh, but uh, for instance, uh, there's the difference between the mixing angle measurements at various experiments. Well, I was discussing NOVA and T2K, which are at GEV. Think about the following. Dune might discover Theta 1, 2, again, rediscover uh, at the GEV scale. And we have that experiment that angle probe from solar experiment at MEV scale. So if these measurements are different, this would clearly imply this kind of scenario. Uh, what is most uh, entertaining to me uh, in this sense uh, for this particular class of models is that here, I don't need new physics to be produced and give me some special signatures, which is what people usually play games. Uh, my light new physics is just, uh, you know, jumping in some higher order corrections and feeding into the change uh, of the PMNS metrics. So I don't have new physics signatures, but just the change of the PMS metrics uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, I didn't mention, but uh, what is also to me a very, it's, it's a very strong statement, but it's not far-fetched in my opinion. Here, uh, we, uh, we found the model and scenarios uh, where you can actually test uh, the origin of neutrino mass at oscillation experiments, because you're uh, sensitive to these PMS matrix elements and PMS matrix elements diagonalize the mass matrix. So actually probing this at oscillation experiments and the previous studies were more focused on the lepton flavor violation and, uh, and there are also of course collider searches. So this is a new avenue for neutrino model builders. Uh, I, I presented the, in the second part the mini Buddha anomaly and our calculations from the background re-evaluations and conclusions that it might not be due to new physics. And, uh, the microbun data also did not unravel this anomaly. The sterile neutrino is disfavored. There are more models, so there are more things to be discussed, and I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not solving this today here. 
And I should just point out that uh, all this field, and uh, especially the neutrino physics uh, in here in the sense of oscillation phenomenology, is a pretty bright future, in my opinion, because today I was using the data from NOAA, T2K, and Miniboon, and notice that all of these experiments have their successor, which is either already running or is being approved. So we will have Dune here, the main experiment in the US, on the neutrino side, and Hyper-K in Japan to inherit T2K, and the, the short based on program is already running at Fermilab. Results from Microboon are already there. We just had discussed them briefly. Icarus, the detector is there. There should have some data soon. And SBND uh, is, uh, I think, approved. Maybe Marcelo knows better. I think it's going to working. Be. They're putting their hookahs. So this is all I had to say. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Do we have questions? So in this uh, micro boom test of the mini boom anomalies, so they they didn't do what they, I thought that they were going to do. That is, first, because mini boom cannot distinguish between photon and electron, so micro boom could have tested is there an anomaly? So in micro boom, so testing electromagnetic showers in general and trying to to compare with expectations, but that was not done. Instead, they did. Uh, separated the photons coming from the delta, not generic photons, uh, electrons. So, so, then, uh, so there still remains the possibility that you have photons there and then uh, that do not come from the delta. Uh, I, I was under similar impression, uh, but then I was corrected. Uh, last time I gave a talk at Santa Barbara in front of some microbial people, even though they didn't call this paper as uh, uh, the the contribution from pions. There's also the pi nodes included in this analysis. And actually, if you see pi nodes, should probably appear somewhere in this table. Neutral current pions. Uh, so they definitely know how to handle those. So uh, I, I don't know. Uh, those photons from pions are also included, and don't don't seem to yeah, be the address. They, they should do an inclusive search. So let, so just to compare, because the first question for micro boon is, can I verify that there is an anomaly in the electromagnetic showers or whatever? Right. And, well, and we haven't, well, maybe they cannot do it. But this is some step forward, right? Because the, now they can claim that this is, for instance, uh, take yeah. this one. This is very powerful. You see a, uh, you see a proton track and you yeah. see uh, uh, you see something displaced, right? Uh, I, I, I don't know if uh, uh, Miniboon should not be able, no, actually, Miniboon, yeah, you're right, actually, yeah. If you're trying to say that uh, Miniboon is an equal footing with that, it probably is because the photon only converts after half a meter or something, but a different technology, different conversion, right? So maybe that's one of the probes maybe, also because well, the maybe they can do this analysis and that, that is what you're mentioning, yeah. but they should say it. If, if what I know that they're doing is they're, since they have their backgrounds and everything, they can do a sterile analysis and some theorists have actually done that, including Pedro. And uh, they're yeah. testing for this particular model that was also written by Pedro uh, two years ago on this uh, uh, light C primes. Uh, How so, light are those Z primes? Oh, this Z prime here is 30 MeV, and it has a very small mixing, a very small mass mixing with the standard model. But wasn't there a problem with LSMD in that case? You have to draw. No, uh, this uh, model actually. It doesn't uh, get LSMD. Is, yeah. that, that model only gets mini boot, not LSMD. Only gets mini No, but uh, one group has actually shown. Uh, for instance, Carlos Argelius for Harvard, he's he shown that, uh, and his friends shown that this uh, model is kind of disfavored at uh, Minerva and the uh, Charm 2 experiments. You basically have, uh, I think they use the electron, because this process is actually coherent, uh, so you don't see the activity from the protons, so they actually use the electron scattering data, uh, and then they, were, uh, they managed to constrain that. Uh, I, I, um, we, we, we can check this paper later, but uh, uh, the best fit point of this model, I think, is described by Tristing more so. But the microbin is currently doing this search, and it's kind of generic. If you're already asking this, uh, uh, from all the list, what looks more, most promising to me is the scenario where this Z is uh, replaced by the scalar. Right. And it turns out that the cross section goes in the other direction. So there, uh, 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 there uh, Minerva, which is at higher energies, cannot test. Uh, cannot test it. And this was done also by some guys. Uh, and replaced by the electron by photons. Uh, uh, here? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, 
So, so um, would, would, wouldn't wouldn't Microboon have told you that you couldn't have many photon events like that? They've got uh, PID to say that. I, yeah. don't, I don't know. So then, uh, you, you mean just one single photon? I thought that, yes. Oh, actually, that's this kind of model, right? This is the magnetic uh, moment portal. This is very similar, right? Can the neutrino just goes to photon and uh, active neutrino? Um, yeah, this model is excluded by, its, by itself because it needs very large mixings. Uh, but, well, but beyond that experiment. Beyond that, uh, then, uh, um, I mean, uh, I, I thought that Miniboon does the analysis, uh, very specific analysis, but micro. No, no, sorry. the microboon did not put out any BSM search yet. I know. So, so uh, I, I don't know. This can be interpreted from, for instance, uh, okay, so. Yeah, but I mean, th that would be like one gamma, one proton, right? If you were to just take their channels that the, they reported phenomenologically, they say, we looked at in the channel, we have one proton and one photon. Right. And if they didn't see an excess. Right, but of course, things depend on the strength of magnetic moment and separations and no, how, how much this is displaced. Okay, good, good. So uh, th there's some considerations. For instance, one model that I know that is definitely probed with current uh, new E situation is, uh, I don't know if it's somewhere on the list, but it was actually by Andre, it was proposed. It was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so it's basically to produce uh, uh, sterile neutrinos directly from the decays of pions, and then have these sterile neutrinos to further decay into some light scalar and new E's, then new E just goes to the detector and does the standard model of scattering. Uh, that's, uh, here everything happens there, and here just the standard physics. So this is much easier to say, okay, the microbe tested this because this part is what they care about, and this is clean because they don't play a new physics game here. If you play a new physics game in the detector, it's a bit more complicated, but naively, you're right. I, I tend to agree with you that, you know, if they're looking for photons or new signature, if that's the culprit for the anomaly, that seems to be uh, on, uh, more disfavored. Wait, so is Andre's model still viable? Uh, I, I mean, a microboon, uh, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, it's not exactly at the level of five sigma, but it's in tension. It's in the same tension that microboon is putting uh, the, New research is putting the minimum. On. Uh, you know. Uh, so we don't have any excellent model to explain the, the anomalies. Uh, this one with the scalar is okay. If you just replace this with the scalar, I think it's uh, unconstrained. Um, and what what is the mass of the scalar? But this scalar then also needs to be very light. We're talking about the scalar or uh, hundred MeV or so. Well, that's okay. Yeah. What's wrong? What's wrong with that man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't you know. like light? You have all these nice running effects. Right. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, since we're already discussing, uh, uh, we're now actually currently working on this. Uh, 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 if we can alleviate the three plus one tension with the running effects, uh, because uh, the sterile mixing angle uh, tend to. Uh, you see, the, the reason why, uh, okay, and I guess uh, we should wrap up at some point, but let me just uh, say this. Um, you see, I said that this is a big tension, and it, it actually is, but if you take some low energy uh, experiments out, and if you have a good reason to take them out, the situation gets better. And with the running effect, you can have a small mixing angle at the MeV scale, at the reactor, and solar energy scale, and something bigger at the minimum scale. So it seems to mildly, uh, fix this figure, this picture here, uh, though, and maybe it revives partially the usual uh, strong you know, uh, framework. Um, but that, that's still something I, I'm looking into. Okay, do we have a final question? Maybe one final question. Uh, um, my question may be irrelevant to this part. So you talked about the safety violation. Uh, I just wonder if we can also detect the time reversal violation. Well, if uh, CPT is conserved, if you have a discovery for this CP part, then I guess the, this follows, or I don't know, is that the right answer? I think that's right. If, if you have CPT in your theory, then the CP violation implies time yeah. reversal violation. I think it bias. Huh? CPT is here. You're biased. But the bias? You are biased by the CPT. I am biased by the CPT. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> did I you are teaching quantum field theory. theory. You, okay. you told your students that CPT. I taught them my bias. Go ahead. 
Did that answer your question? Yeah, I just mean why we uh, just detect the CP? Why not detect the time directly? Well, no, but you're not detecting that. You're just finding complex parameters and oscillations phenomena. And then once you say you have a complex parameter in your interactions, then that's automatically telling you that your theory violates CP or time reversal. Those are equivalents. Okay, but how do you test time reversal? Uh, assume that CPT is not there. So, how do you propose to test time reversal? I think when the new E oscillates into the new. You to do the opposite. Yeah, the um, uh, that's difficult. Yeah. New e to new channel. That's for neutrino factories. We don't have those, but that's a channel that people are discussing in that context. Yeah. Not in the context of uh, uh, T uh, time reversal, but uh, in general as a new channel. But we don't have it. Uh, you know. Because to go from nui to nu mu, you would have to know your fluxes very well, and people just think about mu in the case. So if they ever build a moon collider, this can be tested. Mm -hmm. But anyway, CPT is concerned. That is what the entire point. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks to speaker again. Uh, so we will go for dinner at uh, Nellas, I think is the name. Uh, I will circulate an email. Well, so if you would like to